Well, I want to add my greeting to all the greetings that have already been shared with you this morning. It's a particular joy for me to be able to welcome Don Crowder as our speaker this morning. Uh, Don was on our staff for seven years, serving as our administrator, and he was just a vital part of our ministry team pastoring here with us. It's a joy to have him back today. Uh, since Don left us, uh, he and Sher Sherilyn have joined the uh, Bible Christian, sorry, Bible Centered Ministries, BCM International, and uh, Don serves there and uh, has been with them for now three years, and he will be bringing to us the message today. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I've always wanted to start a service that way. Uh, when I'm in Suriname, that is the way every service starts. The worship leader will greet everybody with a good morning, brothers and sisters but he does it in Dutch, because that's the language of the service that I attend. So I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Suriname at uh, Berea Church. I also bring you greetings from our Canadian Executive Director, Phil Whitehead, and from our International President, Dr. Marty Windell. It's been my pleasure to serve with BCM for these last three years in, in what I think is kind of a unique role. Uh, BCM has been around since 1936 and started in Philadelphia as children's Bible clubs. Since then, it has grown considerably and, and is now in uh, over 60 countries in the world with over 900, or nearly 900 missionaries who serve in those various fields. The main thrust of BCM is reaching children and strengthening the church worldwide. The uh, ministry began, as I said, in Philadelphia with Bible clubs for children and has now expanded to so much more than that uh, including church planting and so on. So there's much that we do. My particular role is as minister at large for member care. And uh, I have the privilege of working alongside so many of those missionaries who serve around the world. And uh, that's the largest congregation I've ever pastored. There's nearly 900 people. Uh, I get to speak at conferences and uh, in churches around the world. I'm, uh, when I'm Work, working with individuals, I'm coaching and training uh, new missionaries as they prepare for their particular ministries. And uh, I'm now, uh, well, travel has been limited in this last uh, nine months or so. Uh, so much of that is done online. It is done through Zoom and Skype and, and WhatsApp and even telephone and so on. But it's been a great uh, responsibility that I've had and I have enjoyed doing every bit of it. I've more recently been uh, appointed to serve as interim director at the International Academy of Suriname. And so BCM and IAS, the International Academy of Suriname, have formed a working partnership in uh, which we can together reach the people of Suriname. The objectives of both organizations are very similar. And so we could collaborate on, uh, on uh, accomplishing that purpose. So um, BCM International, which is in the United States particularly, uh, overseeing the worldwide ministry, and the International Academy of Suriname, which has international students and international teachers at it, makes a great combination. We have a very modern campus compared to many other campuses in the country. It probably pales in comparison to much of what you would see here in North America, but uh, is a great campus for uh, a country like Suriname, which is a developing country, a third world country. Uh, we have a gymnasium, and one of our greatest boasts is that we have the largest English language collection in our library in the entire country. And that's not a huge library by any means, but we have the largest English language one. When all of our teachers are there, when we've been able to fill every position, we would have about 20 teachers, and there are uh, five people who work in administration and another six who work in maintenance. Unfortunately, we've not been able to fill all of the positions at the school, and so we only have 16 teachers right now. We've had to double up one class, and then I've taken on some responsibility to oversee the guidance counselor position and the uh, AP coordinator. AP is advanced placement, where students do university-level courses in preparation for going to university. Last year, we graduated 10 students from grade 12, and they all left with a North American high school diploma. Many of you will remember Sarah Mork, uh, who teaches at the school. Uh, Sarah teaches uh, middle schools science and math. 
Um, she wanted me to remember her to you uh, today as I came. Uh, what I've really wanted to show you in the picture, in addition to showing you Sarah, was the way we have accommodated the uh, off-campus teaching. So our off-campus teaching, of course, is online now. All of our students uh, log in every day into their classes, but it's only the teachers who come to the school and they teach from their class. So you can see that uh, somebody like Sarah sits in, a, in one location, she has her uh, computer in front of her, she has a big flat screen TV so she can see all of her students, she has a document scanner and of course the board behind her. And then uh, we have other teachers like our pre-K teacher whose uh, equipment is all on a cart because she has about four different locations in her classroom where she teaches, so she moves from one to the other. So we have done all that we could to accommodate this new system of teaching online. We're hoping that we'll have students back in classes on January 11th. I think some of the numbers in Suriname may be threatening that a little bit, but um, my understanding of what's uh, going to be happening in days ahead is we will have a combination of teaching students on campus and students online all at the same time, and so we have prepared ourselves for that. As I mentioned, we didn't get all of the teachers we wanted last year, and we still will need some new ones this year, so uh, I've put together a list of all of the teaching positions that we need to fill. Some of these are uh, positions that we could not fill last year. Some of them are new this year, but then there's also some expanded courses that we'd like to offer just to be able to offer the students a better and fuller rounded um, program so that their uh, certificate or their diploma represents uh, a wide range of education. We also need a director. That's the role that I have been filling, and I have made it clear that uh, that needs to come to an end. And so while we have been looking hard for someone, we've not found somebody who can fill both the academic and the administrative roles uh, well. So we're still looking at that. So if you know of anybody who qualifies to be the director or more commonly known in North America here as the principal of a school uh, or someone who would teach, but they have to have a mission's heart, that's one of the keys. They have to, be a mission, have, to have a mission's heart and be qualified to teach as a teacher here in North America. So those are the things that we're looking forward to. I invite you to pray with us as we... Um, uh, look for the new director, for new teachers, and for new students. We were hit hard by COVID-19 this year and lost a number of students, and I chalked that up to the fact that so many of them were not able to travel. Our students are largely international students, and when there are no planes going in or out of your country, then nobody is coming or going, and so we did lose some students. We're not able to replace them. So pray as well that we would have protection from COVID-19 and for those students who do return to campus, hopefully in January. That's kind of what the ministry is. I thank you for your partnership with me and with BCM in, ac in ac accomplishing this. Our prayer is that we would be very successful in what we do. One of the things that took place in the 1980s is that most of the missionaries left Suriname, and so there are not very many there. And we have the privilege of being missionaries in a country, particularly working with children in the field of education. Well, COVID-19 certainly threw a curve at us in this last year, and we've uh, had difficulty in a lot of ways trying to adjust to it, and as we look forward to, what does this next year hold in store for us? Uh, I wanted us to think back, and I want us to think forward this morning as we uh, consider something from God's Word. Uh, I've entitled the sermon, Say What? And it comes out of Numbers 22 to 24. That scripture may sound familiar to you as Pastor John introduced it to us last week. But I want to do a fuller, uh, rather than focusing in on one thing, I want to cover that whole story of Balaam. And uh, it causes us to step back just a moment and review what has taken place in this past year and how we have lived our lives in relation to uh, the will of God. And then to look forward and see how will we live our lives this coming year in 2021 as we attempt to follow the will of the Lord. Every follower has faced situations in which we wanted to do something that was different than what God wanted us to do. There's no question about that. Sometimes we have been acutely aware of the conflict and at other times we've had to stand back and say, uh oh, because we missed the mark. 
And sometimes we really didn't care. You see, we want what we want, and there's no uh, giving on that. It's the greed of our souls. We presume that our way is best. We think that we know what is the best thing, and whatever enhances my happiness is what is best. And I lightheartedly, I caution you, will remind people sometimes that God never asks me for my opinion. Uh, God always knows better than I do. We had a teacher that I hired uh, last year, uh, was actually the Bible teacher, who was a missionary with another organization. Unfortunately, his life did not measure up with the statements that he was making, and it came time for us to part our ways. He was doing what would bring pleasure to him and satisfaction to him, but was totally contrary to what God would want for his or anybody else's life as a believer in Jesus Christ. So now you have heard of Balaam. As I mentioned, Pastor John introduced Balaam to us last week, and uh, we're just going to review a little bit. We're not going to cover everything that Pastor John did, but we're going to uh, review just a little bit of the journey and the people who are involved. uh, Balaam's name means devourer. Uh, He was a soothsayer, a pagan diviner. He was one who had an international reputation. Leaders from all over the world at that time knew about Balaam, and if they needed anything done with the gods, then Balaam was the best guy to have come and, and do that work that you needed with the gods. That was Balaam. The other character in the story is Balak. Balak was the king of Moab, and his name means devastator. And isn't it interesting that we would have in this story two people, one who is devourer and one who is devastator, and these two cannot even get along. We also know that this is a true story. In 1967, archaeologists discovered the existence of a Balaam, and some of his writings have been preserved, and it was easily tied to this Balaam that we have recorded in Scripture. So that's what we have as some background for the people who are involved. But let's find out the setting now. We know that Israel has been traveling in the wilderness on their way to the land of Canaan, the promised land. And they have, in in the recent days of the story, uh, over a period, a number of years, come up to this point. They've come up kind of the east side of the Dead Sea area in, in that range after wandering around the wilderness for nearly 40 years. They made a loop out around Moab and then came in at the top, uh, the north border of of Moab. But when they got there, they had asked permission of the Amorites to simply move through their territory. Uh, They had no designs on the Amorite territory. They simply wanted passage through, said that we will pay for any food that we eat, we'll pay for the water that we drink, but we just need to pass through because we're on our way over west of here to, uh, to Canaan. But the kings in, uh, among the Amorite people declined to let them go through and, in fact, attacked them. And when they went to war, the Amorites were completely destroyed, and the Israelites took over that territory, and this, they settled it. So it was now Israelite territory. But they settled on the uh, plains of Moab, right near the Jordan River, uh, right by Jericho. That was where they were going to cross the river and go into the land of promise and begin their conquest of that land. But the kings of of, um, the Amorites would not let them go through uh, and and wage that war. The Amorites were defeated, as I said, and is now Israelite territory. But one other guy right near there was uh, Balak, king of Moab. These people were all right at his north border. And the Bible records for us that he and his people were absolutely terrified, so terrified that they were actually sick because they were afraid of this huge, vast group of people would come and attack them and destroy them in the same way they had attacked uh, the Ammonites or the Amorites and killed off Sion and Og, the two main kings in that area. And so we come to where we are today when Balaam gets introduced into the story. So we want to first look at the lure of the enemy. The lure of the enemy. Here we are at that border, and Balak is scared skinny. He really wants out of this situation, but he knows that he cannot defeat 
the Israelites because they are far too vast in number. And the only way for him to get around this and to have any victory over the Israelites is for him to invoke the pleasure of the gods. And he would do that through Balaam, the oracle. Uh, He would call on him to come and curse Israel, and that would give him an advantage over that vast nation. He could look down and see them, and see parts of them from here and parts of them from another spot, but he would need to have someone come and put some supernatural emphasis or impact against the Israelite people so that he could defeat them. That was his only way of being successful in that. So he sent for Balaam. He sent a delegation off uh, with the price for uh, a soothsayer, a diviner, and went off to find Balaam in his own country. When they presented the situation to him, Balaam said, well, I need to pray about this, and so he went off and spoke to the Lord my God, is the terminology that he uses. And that's an interesting term that he should use as a pagan. What we do know is that he would invoke the gods of any nation in order to gain favor and to, in a way, manipulate them. The gods were obligated to do as the oracle stated. So one group went off of princes, um, important people in in, uh, the Moabite kingdom, went off to find Balaam and to invite him to come. Balaam prayed about it. No, God said, you should not go with these people because I have blessed Israel, so don't go. And he went back and told the, the emissaries who went back to, to Balak and told him that. And of course, he was not going to settle for that. And so he sent another delegation of more important princes and more important people who would go. And he even raised the ante a little bit and said, I will give you a, a large amount of money to come and do this job for me. And again, Balaam prayed about it to the Lord my God. And this time, God said, go. Since these men have come, yes, you can go. But only say what I tell you to say. And that was the key. Only tell what I tell you to say. And so Balaam got up and went along with them on the way back. What we find interesting about this, though, is that sometimes God lets us do as we please, but. There's always a but. God lets us do as we please, but. One of the things we need to understand is that God sometimes allows us to do the things that we want for a purpose, and that purpose will feed right into His will as well. You have to remember when uh, Israel was at the land of the promise at the southern uh, edge of it and had the opportunity to go in shortly after they came out of Egypt. And they declined to do that. In a vote, only two people said, yes, let's go. And the other 10 said, no, let's not go. And as a result, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. That's the but. They had an opportunity Uh, to go in and conquer the land, but they would not do that. So then they changed their minds and said, okay, we'll go up against the Amalekites and uh, and we'll beat them. And uh, when that happens, then we will uh, be in good shape then. We could could defeat them. But Moses said to them, no, don't go. God will not be with you. But they said, well, we're going anyway. And away they went. And of course, they were run right out of the country. So that was the but in that. David wanted what he wanted. In the spring of the year, he was on the rooftop of his house instead of going off to war, and he saw a beautiful woman bathing, and he wanted her, and he got her. But the outcome of all of that was the death of the woman's husband, the death of a child, and absolute chaos in David's own family. Solomon wanted peace with all the countries around him. And so the way that he did that was to uh, broker deals with them and then to marry or take as concubines their daughters. And what king would ever attack a country where his daughter lived? And so Solomon ended up with 300 wives and 700 concubines. But he had peace with everybody around him. But God had warned him and other kings as well not to marry multiple wives because they would lead you astray. And that's exactly the way Solomon ended, worshiping pagan gods. 
And then we cannot forget Romans chapter one. In Romans chapter one, people determined that it was not worth knowing God. There was no value in that, it wasn't important. And so they uh, dove right into idolatry and into immorality. And scripture there records for us that God gave them over to sexual impurity, shameful lusts, and a depraved mind. The people wanted what they wanted, and God was at that point then willing to say, fine, you do what you want, but you will experience the full extent of your sin. The lure of the enemy, sometimes God lets us do as we please, but, and remember that there is always a but. And then we have the intervention of God. We choose to move ahead in the direction that we want, and God has to intervene. And so now we come to that part of the story that everybody knows, Balaam and his donkey. And we don't know whether this is the comedic part of the story or what we do with it, but uh, we're not sure which is funnier, a talking donkey or a man who's carrying on a conversation with a talking donkey. But one way or another, somebody seems to be out of place. Uh, This is the sort of thing that animated cartoons are made of. But here is a real story. This actually happened. As they were going down the road, all of a sudden, Balaam's donkey, probably his uh, circa 1500 BC Dodge donkey, how's that? Headed off the road. Instead of going straight ahead down the road, turned off the road and into a field. Balaam beat the donkey to get her back onto the road. Then went on a little further. They came to a narrower spot in the road, and the donkey came off to one side near a wall and crushed Balaam's leg against the wall. And that angered Balaam, and he beat the donkey again. And as they went on a little further, all of a sudden the donkey stopped and laid down with Balaam on top of her. And that, of course, angered Balaam, and he beat the donkey again. You see, the donkey could see something that Balaam could not. And the donkey then begins to speak. Why have you beat me these three times? And Balaam's response was, because you've made a fool of me. With all this entourage with me and my servants and so on, you've made a fool out of me by not allowing this trip to carry on the road. You've veered off here, you've stopped here, you've crushed my foot, you, you, you haven't done a good job here. And the donkey says, have I not served you well? for all these years? Why do you think I would disobey you at this point? Of course, Balaam was thinking if I had a sword, I would kill you. (laughs) That's how badly you embarrassed me, but now he has to say no. You have not disobeyed me. You have been a good donkey in all of these years. Sometimes we don't see the obstacles that God places in our way to direct us to his will. In this case, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord blocking the road, but Balaam couldn't see it. It wasn't until after he'd had his conversation with the donkey when all of a sudden Balaam's eyes seemed to be open and he could see the angel of the Lord on the road ahead of him and the angel had his sword drawn. Isn't it interesting that Balaam would have killed his donkey if he'd had a sword? And here is the angel of the Lord with a sword in hand, and the angel says, listen, if if you had come on through, then I would have killed you and spared your donkey. God was doing what he needed to do in order to stop Balaam from heading down a road. The road that you're going down is a reckless road. This is not the will of God. This is not what you are supposed to be doing. And isn't it interesting for us that first God says, do not go, and then he says, go. Now what we're finding is that the angel of the Lord was there to oppose him. And it's very clear to us that when God said, go, what he was saying was what my father-in-law used to say, do what you want, you will anyway. We have three occasions when God was saying no or putting something in the way to say, no, don't go. And so we can only conclude that he was allowing Balaam to do what Balaam wanted to do. But it would come around in the end to what God wanted. Sometimes we don't see the obstacles that God places in our way to direct us into his will. In Revelation chapter 3, 
We find Jesus speaking to the church, saying, See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. There are opportunities that God allows us to do, in fact, maybe puts in front of us so that we would seize those opportunities. But the very fact that there is an open door here must imply that there are other doors that are closed. And it's those ones that we need to be very cautious of as well. We don't want to push open the door that God has closed. We need to go through the doors that God opens, which is exactly what is happening here. Balaam is trying to go through the doors that's closed because that's what he wants. You see, we want what we want. And sometimes God lets us do as we please, but then we have to be prepared to suffer the consequences of that. Sometimes we don't see the obstacles that God places in our way to direct us into his will. God does have a will, and God is working on a plan, and we have the pleasure of working along with him following his plan. So we have the lure of the enemy and the intervention of God, and so now we come to the plan of God, So what is the plan of God? Sometimes we go uncertain of what is at the end. How will this end? What what am I supposed to do along the way sometimes? It's difficult for us to know and we follow along blindly. We've gone through periods like that in our lives and eventually God will let us know what it is he wants us to do. I can remember a number of years ago when I was pastoring a very small church. I had finished Bible college and now was uncertain about where I was to go, except that I knew that I would continue as a pastor. God had called me to be a pastor when I was a teenager. And so I would continue now as a pastor. But where would I go? Certainly not in this little wee church. Surely there would be a bigger church that I could pastor. But God kept me at that little church, and I could not understand that. Until one day, June, I can't remember the year now, 1997, I think, It was our anniversary service, and I preached the service. Our congregation would swell from the usual 19 people up to about 25. And that was a big crowd for us on anniversary Sunday. I preached a message, and I gave an invitation, and Harold came forward. One man. Harold was one of our regular attenders, but I also knew that he was the only person in the church who was not a follower of Jesus Christ. But that day, he became a follower of Christ. He trusted Christ for salvation. I had the pleasure of leading him in that. Three days later, two churches were after me to come as their pastor. And so I concluded that the only reason I had stayed at that first church so long was because God had a plan for me to be involved in the life of Harold. And once Harold was saved, I was free to go. And that seems to be the way things worked out, and I've found great contentment in that explanation uh, ever since. Sometimes we don't see the obstacles that God places in our way to direct us to his will. So now we have the plan of God. What is God's plan for Balaam and for uh, Balak? What's God's plan for Israel? Well, if you're familiar with the story, if you read it through as we were encouraged to do last week, You'd find the plan of God is being worked out. As Balak saw Balaam coming closer, he ran out to meet him, and he took him to a high point of land where he could look down and see part of the nation of Israel camped on the doorsteps of Moab. And from there, he would be able to curse Israel. Remember, that's what it was all about. Balak needed somebody to curse Israel so that he could be victorious over them in a battle. And Balaam went away, and he came back with this message, that he cannot revoke God's blessing. He cannot nullify God's blessing. He cannot erase it in any way. What God has done, God has done, and no man can do otherwise. Balak was not pleased. His response was, I invited you here to curse them, not to bless them, but all you've done is bless them. Let me show you another spot. And so they went to another high point, and they looked down, and they see another part of the nation. And remember, this is, I, my guess is there were close to three million people down there. And they couldn't see them all from one vantage point, and so they went to the second one. And we had the same thing. He went away. The blessing comes back. It's not a curse anymore. It's a blessing. 
God's blessing is irreversible. It cannot be changed. Not just er er eliminated, it cannot even be changed. Because what God does doesn't change. He is steady, he is consistent, his plan is good. I have a personal preference in saying that God does not have a plan B. God only has one plan. Sometimes we will mess it up and cause him to go around it somehow, but he comes back to where he wanted to be. There's only a plan A for God. So we have that Balaam can't revoke God's blessing, and God's blessing is irreversible, and so Balak was not happy with that one either. If you're not going to curse them, then don't bless them either. They went to a third point and looked down at God's people down there, the Israelites. And Balaam came back again with another blessing. And this one really concludes that God's blessing is absolute. It will not change. It will stay exactly as it is. Nobody can change it in any way or nullify it, cannot remove it. God's blessing is absolute. We have three blessings that have come on the nation of Israel at this point. I want to skip the fourth one for a moment. I want to go to the fifth, sixth, and seventh. There were seven oracles that Balaam gave all at that time. Those last three are that the Amalekites will be destroyed, the Kenites will be destroyed by Assyria, and the Assyrians and the eastern regions will be destroyed by nations in the west who will then themselves be destroyed. Do you see the picture that we have here? We have three blessings coming on Israel, and then we have three curses that are coming on Israel's enemies. Grammatically and structurally, we call this a chiasm because there's one point in there, which is the fourth point which Pastor John preached last Sunday. And it all points to that. Three blessings, three curses. In the middle is someday there will be a king come out of Israel. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise up in Israel. And this will be the king of kings, the everlasting king, the Lord of glory. And we cannot deny the fact that at some point this king would come. He would come out of Israel and he would indeed be a blesser of his people and a conqueror of his enemies. And that, some of that may still be being fill, fulfilled in the days to come. But for right now, we have a Messiah, a deliverer, who has come to rescue his people. Sometimes we reject God's plan because it's not what we want to hear. Balaam didn't like, or Balak didn't like any of those um, blessings or curses because eventually it would capture him as well. Balak rejected everything, and finally, Balaam and Balak parted their ways. They went separate ways and both went to their own homes. Balaam didn't get paid. (laughs) Balak had said, listen, this Lord who has prevented you from cursing Israel has prevented me from paying you too. So there was no money in it. Sometimes we reject God's plan because it's not what we want to hear. Isn't that true? Sometimes God says something to us and we really don't know what to do with it. We don't want to hear that. It's not what our plan is. We have to remember sometimes that Scripture shouts at us. Scripture is loud and clear about God's will. All we have to do is pay attention and then follow it. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done. In Romans chapter 12, we're told to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we will be able to understand, to know what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In Colossians chapter 1, we're told to bear fruit in good works, to grow in the knowledge of God, to gain endurance and patience from his strength in us, and to joyfully give thanks. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, we're taught, be sanctified, for this is the will of God. You see, Scripture shouts at us on how we are to live every day. Other people can also give godly counsel. If we can find some good Christian men and women around us who we can confide in and talk to about 
what we ought to be doing in a particular situation or what they sense would be the best move for us. Proverbs chapter 15 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. It's not wrong to have good people around us. 1 Kings 19 is the story of Rehoboam, who has just become the king of all of Israel. He is the son of Solomon. Solomon, the wisest king, and, and he's followed by Rehoboam. Rehoboam was getting some pushback from the northern part of the kingdom on how they had been treated by Solomon, and they wanted some changes. And Rehoboam talked, first of all, to the elders, the wise counselors that his father had used, and got their advice. And then he also sought the counsel of his friends, the young men that he had grown up with and had gathered around him. In the end, he took their advice. And the result of that was that the nation split in two. Top, the northern ten tribes split away, and that became known what we have known as Israel. And the southern two tribes became known as Judah. But the kingdom was divided as a result of Rehoboam's decision. And then God speaks to us sometimes in a still, small voice. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah is running away, afraid for his life. As far as he's concerned, he's the only, the only follower of God left, which is not true, not by a long shot. But as far as he knows, he's the only one left, and he's running for his life, and he hides in a cave. And finally, God comes to him and says, you need to get out of the cave, Elijah. Go and stand at the entrance. When he stood at the entrance, there was a mighty wind that came along, blowing and causing everything to sway and to break and so on. But Elijah realized that God was not in that mighty wind. And then there was a powerful earthquake that shook the land and the rocks fell. But Elijah realized God was not in that powerful earthquake either. And then there was a scorching fire. It didn't take long for Elijah to realize that God was not in the fire. And then there was a gentle whisper. And it's in the whisper that he heard God speak. You see, God speaks to us in a variety of ways, but sometimes all we need to do is be still and know that he is God. To listen for the voice of God in our spirits. So there are ways for us to understand the plan of God. Balak rejected it because it was not what he wanted to hear. How do we do? Do we reject what we hear God saying because this is really not what we want to hear? Remember, we want what we want. And it takes a strong person to say, you know, I need to allow God to rule. I need to allow God to have his way and I will follow him. I will pay attention to what God's will is. I'll listen to those who are around me. I'll watch scripture to see what it's saying. When I first came into ministry, my pastor had said to me, whenever you're studying Bible, whenever you hear something, anything that comes along that confirms your calling, <clears throat> write it down. Somewhere at home I have a book that has pages and pages and pages of scripture where I've written down because that was a confirmation to me, or something that somebody said, or a gift that we've received, anything that to me was confirmation. God speaks to us in some great ways to let us know what his will is. Let me give you four takeaways this morning. The first one, God's will is knowable. We do not have to walk blindly along. Sometimes we don't know all the steps along the way. But God's will is knowable. Where are we going to end up? That's what we can determine. God is not a secret in that sense. He will reveal to us what his will is. We also need to remember the second one now. God's will supersedes ours. God's will is higher than our will. God's will is going to be uh, firm. God will accomplish what he wants to do. And he is God, and I am not. And so we need to pay attention to what God's will is and allow it to supersede ours, because it always will. 
The third one, God leads us into his will. He puts us in circumstances. He puts us in contact with people. He gives us the information that we need to be able to follow his will. And so he gives us that kind of direction. And then finally, God's will is good. God does not do bad things. The Father of the heavenly lights is a giver of good gifts. And he leads us into good things. His plans, his objectives, his will are always good and they're far, far greater than ours. And God's will will prevail. I want to encourage you as you consider that uh, today, as you look back at this past year and you kind of do some evaluation. This is the time we do it. The year is just about done and we need to look back and see how did we do this last year in terms of our uh, obedience to God. Because God had a plan for us this year. Did we follow it? We can do that as individuals. We can do that in the church. We can do that as businesses. We can do it as family. We can do it any way we want. But did we follow God's will The other part of it is to look forward into 2021. How will I respond in 2021? Will I pay attention to what I hear God saying? Am I willing to follow his plan? Or do I have to insist on it being mine? In which case, remember, there is always a but. When we follow our own way, there will be a but because God's will is good and it will stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you have taught us today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your plan. By your invitation, here we are. By your predetermination, here we are. And we only need to consciously decide that we will indeed follow what you desire. So work in our hearts, work in our spirits, so that we become obedient followers of you. Amen. Well, I want to thank Pastor Don for the very relevant message that he shared with us today. It certainly is an appropriate message for us to hear on the eve of a new year as we all wonder how this year will end and what God has in store for us in this coming year. I trust that the truths that you've heard today will help you as you begin to set goals for this coming year, as you begin to pray about what God would have you do in this coming year. And may our great God, who is our refuge and strength, May he help every one of us not to push for our own will, but to be careful to discern what his will is, be willing to accept it and embrace it. And may he equip us with everything we need for the doing of his will and work in us that which is pleasing in his sight, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.